sentences, but not long words. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I would have thought that if, if, if this microorganism, let me cover myself there, uh, came out with DNA which looked more like humans, uh, than uh, humans look no, like... We're talking uh, about the flagellum. No, you asked me for an example of, of false uh, Answer this question, then go, on the, then go on the offensive. Hmm? Answer this question, then go on the offensive. Well, I am, the, I am answering the question. I'm <laughs> and saying then, that if it looked... If the, if the DNA of that microorganism were closer to human beings than human beings are to chimpanzees, I think that Darwinians would need you know, a long night uh, down at the local bar, quite frankly. <laughs> now, now it's your turn to ask questions. Oh, good-o. <laughs> well, I, I'm a little, un I, you know, it's a little mean. Nobody seems to be plugging my books quite as much as I'm plugging other people's books. <laughs> but I did want to talk about uh, Michael Behe's uh, a wonderful book, uh, Darwin's Flag Box, <laughs> um, where I, I take it that, and, and one of the things I want to compliment you on, Michael, and, and this, is, this is not just rhetorical, but, um, is the fact that uh, unlike so many creationists, certainly creationists in the past, uh, you haven't just attacked other people uh, or other people's theories, but that you've tried to uh, explain some views of your own. And I gather, well, I know that you put forward this uh, view about uh, design uh, and complexity. Uh, you uh, describe it uh, in, in terms which, uh, well, the modesty factor doesn't seem to be too high. Uh, the result of these cumulative e efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level, is a loud, clear, piercing cry of design. The result is so unambiguous, so significant, that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. The discovery rivals those of Newton and Einstein, Lavoisier and Schrodinger, Pasteur and Darwin. What's now, the question? A, you know, pretty heavy stuff. Um, tell us about this theory. Tell us, I mean, now, I mean, for instance, Newton's theory uh, uh, enables us to quantify, okay, to make um, predictions. Think. What is your theory? Well, it's that you can detect intelligent design in the interaction of parts of systems. And it's not really, you know, the... Uh, I, um, uh, it's, uh, suppose you were out walking in um, a woods with a friend of yours, and all of a sudden a friend of yours was pulled up by the ankle by a vine wrapped around it, and as he was left dangling, uh, you pulled him down and you reconstructed and you saw that the uh, limb was uh, covered over with leaves and that the, uh, the vine was staked down. You would immediately know that that was designed. It was not a... Uh, it was not a an accidental so arrangement. So a design of means a designer. Are we talking about God now? Well, uh, most people will think so. Uh, I think so, but I want to leave it open, and not just because I'm being coy. Now, uh, are we talking me... about a good God now? Well, let me answer your first question. <laughs> let me answer your first question. Uh, Francis Crick, in 1972, uh, wrote a paper entitled Directed Panspermia. And the burden of the paper was essentially that uh, problems with imagining an undirected origin of life on Earth were so severe that perhaps we should consider the hypothesis that space aliens sent a rocket ship filled with spores to seed life on Earth a long time ago. Now, if Francis Crick looked at the bacterial flagellum or the intracellular transport system or the blood clotting system and said he thought it was designed by a space alien, I would have no scientific quarrel with him. I argue that you can, uh, you can tell who the uh, that... Uh, a system was designed, but the identity of the designer is, is a more difficult question. But is this designer responsible when things go wrong or for parasites, these co complex parasites? Well, uh, that's the argument from evil. That is, bad things happen to good people, and it's been discussed in religious literature for many, many years, going back to the book of Job. What about complex parasites? Did this designer design complex parasites, or is that evolution? <laughs> No, I mean, you get uh, all the good things, uh, and evolutionists get all the bad things. All right. uh, <laughs> that's a very good line, and we'll end on that note. <laughs> Mr. Buckley and Mr. Lee. <laughs> Mr. Buckley, it's your opportunity to question Mr. Lee. Yeah, um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Lynn, I, I'm frankly a little bit emasculated by the approach of you and your colleagues uh, tonight, which is really very uh, ingratiating. And um, uh, uh, it, it, it really delights me. But it seems to me that you are conveying the impression that uh, uh, the evolutionist theory 
is other than what most people know it to be, which is materialist uh, uh, philosophy. Now, it's, um, it's, it's wonderful that notwithstanding your affinity for that explanation of things, uh, you, you still believe in the, in the possibility of a, of a creator, indeed, even of a Christian creator. But uh, what would you make with this, the following statement, Richard uh, Lewontin, uh, the primary problem, <clears throat> he means in the current uh, confusion, is not to provide the public with the knowledge of how far it is to the nearest store and what genes are made of. Rather, the problem is to get them to reject irrational and supernatural explanations of the world, the demons that exist only in their imagination, and to accept a social and intellectual apparatus, science, as the only begetter of truth. Now, <clears throat> Uh, that, that is the public voice, as I understand it, of the materialist uh, evolutionist. Do you uh, transcend it, or do you disavow it, or do you consider it inauthentic? Or, oh, no, or I, ju I just disavow it, because I think that it is obviously possible to believe in the idea of a god, a god who has a presence and an interest uh, in uh, humanity without rejecting the overwhelming data that supports evolution and the failure of anything, Mr. Buckley, to in fact contradict it. In other words, you have uh, picked a few uh, squabbles with evolution, but you haven't even suggested for a moment what the mechanism is with which you would replace it. Well, but what, what if one simply uh, advances basic intelligence and says um, some, such, 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 some such thing as that, uh, in fact, a lot of monkeys turned loose over an infinite number of time could not, would not reproduce a, a Shakespeare. Does that, does that sound as a, an arrogant uh, rejection of, um, of, a, uh, uh, of a random uh, 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 explanations for what we see about us? No, not at all. I think that uh, one of the great things about randomness and chance is that they are used in this process of evolution, as I personally view it, as remarkable tools within that toolbox of uh, God's creative interest. I mean, to reject the idea that chance is something that could be used by the divine is to limit the power of the divine considerably. The divine is not uh, sitting uh, a bunch of monkeys in a, uh, a building with a bunch of typewriters. I think we're a little more sophisticated than that, and I think that the process well, of evolution I, I, I is I far more are. creative than that. <clears throat> I think you are more sophisticated, manifestly, uh, from, from, uh, by my criteria, but uh, Richard Lewontin is a man uh, uh, with very substantial uh, bona fides in, in your community. So uh, if, if, if we want uh, jointly to uh, excommunicate him from the rational uh, 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 fraternity, <clears throat> I think we should do so uh, piously. Well we, well, we congregationalists, of course, don't excommunicate. That's one of the differences between us. <laughs> So, so there, therefore, therefore, we we will do what with some simply point to that as the excesses to which some nice people nevertheless go. Oh, I think, frankly, uh, Bill, that the truth in, on this side is that the the folks who represent the position that we've been articulating have been very good about going to conferences and trying to separate people's scientific uh, views from their religious ones. And I wish that the other side did the same thing. And I wish fundamentally that we could understand that some questions are theological <clears throat> questions, others are scientific, and we work better at solving and resolving and even discussing those questions when we realize that there are two kinds of language and two kinds of issues. You There's could, nothing extreme about that position. You can now ask philosophical and scientific questions. Okay, Mr. well, Buckley. Mr. Buckley, you know, I have heard it said that even God does not know the mind of William F. Buckley. <laughs> but my question is the obverse. Do you know the mind of God so well that you could rule out the possibility that God conceived evolution as the process to bring his design to fruition? Well, I decline to answer that question because... On what grounds? Well, because my imagination is finite, and the Creator's is not. Under the circumstances, uh, I simply uh, pass, uh, not, uh, not only for tactical reasons, but for reasons of, uh, of, of profound uh, belief. Uh, I, I do find it... Uh, well, I can't answer. Go ahead. No, go but, ahead. Let me, but, but uh, that only goes to half of the question, because the truth is that, that if you are saying that you cannot imagine that a God could be that creative, that imaginative, then aren't you limiting, in a very severe fashion, your construct of God? 
I think that's a very serious question, and I 